He is Auxiliary Bishop of Astana, Kazakhstan, a well-known defender of the Catholic traditional faith. He joins me this evening to share his thoughts on the agenda of the second installment of the Synod on Synodality and some controversial new consultors appointed to the Vatican's doctrinal office. And his latest book, Flee from Heresy, A Catholic Guide to Ancient and Modern Errors. Please welcome back to the program Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Uh, tell me why you decided it was necessary to write a book about heresies. First of all, tell us what is a heresy and why revive and remind us of the concept now? Well, we are living in a time of unprecedented doctrinal crisis and confusion in the life of the Church. And so it is um, a requirement of my episcopal duty to help the faithful, to strengthen them in faith, and to help them to be protected of the spiritual poison of heresy, because heresy is um, a distortion of the divine truth which God revealed us in several forms. Mm. Uh, the heresy formally defined, it is a denial, a obstinate denial of a divinely revealed truth. This is the mm. official definition of uh, heresy. And so, and there are other forms of material heresy when there is not a formal statement, but people are speaking errors, maybe without being conscious of this. And then mm -hmm. are simple errors of doctrine, which are not directly contradicting a dogma of faith. Mm. Uh, the bishop, I love in the book you, you quote Origen, who says that uh, you know heresy is is really like lights on cliffs to allure and destroy vessels in quest of refuge, so that the prince of the world lights fires of false knowledge in order to destroy men. I thought that was an apt visual of what a heresy is. Um, you have assembled here a compendium of heresies, Gnosticism and pantheism, um, Arianism, Wycliffism, rejecting, you know, the papal primacy, uh, Freemasonry. Why is it necessary to remind faithful people of these errors from the past and the present? Well, uh, to say that there were always heresies in the life of the Church, and will be, mm. because the Church is a militant Church, and we have to, to fight for the truth, we have to fight for Christ, we have to fight for safe souls from the darkness of error. And so the heresies, as Origen mentioned, are, has, they have this seductive power to, mm. to seduce people by apparent truth or half-truth. And therefore, they are so dangerous. And the task of the Church since the apostolic times is to unmask these fake uh, doctrines, these attempts to deceit the simple faithful. Your Excellency, what is the gravest modern error or heresy that you encounter in your work today? I would consider the greatest modern heresy and error, it is relativism, doctrinal mm. relativism that says that there is no permanent perennial truth, that truth is, they say, changing according to the historical times and circumstances. Basically, mm. relativism says that uh, truths is a product of man. So man says what is true and what is not true. It is a complete subjectivism, and so man, uh, he becomes the lord of truth or not truth. And this is a direct attack against the divine primacy of God who is the truth, Jesus Christ, and who reveals us the truth. 
Relative to all of this, Your Excellency, there are a number of new consultors who were appointed this week at the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. That is the Vatican's doctrinal office, 28 of them to be exact. Now, most of these consultors are Italian priests and theologians. There are a few nuns. But I want to highlight two of these consultors. First, to Father Mauricio Chiodi. He is a moral theologian who, in 2022, said Catholics could, in some cases, disregard church teaching on contraception. And then, citing Amoris Laetitia, he said, under certain conditions and deepening of circumstances, homosexual relationships uh, can be the most fruitful way for homosexual couples to enjoy good relations, end quote. Your Excellency, what do you make of this appointment to the Vatican's doctrinal office? Well, first, as a bishop, I cannot uh, criticize uh, the, the papal appointments. This is a task of the pope. But I can only speak, and I don't know exactly these theologians all. But what I want to say is something uh, in principle. So mm -hmm. the dicastery for the doctrine of faith is an advisory body for the pope, for the Roman pontiff, for his most important task to keep and transmit the Catholic faith, the deposit of faith, inviolable, and so in integrally. And these dicastery and the consultors, they have the task to help the Pope to transmit, to keep the faith uh, integrally inviolably, and therefore they must be the best and most surest theologians who are examples of fidelity to the Catholic faith. And this requires the nature of the meaning of the dicastery for the doctrine of faith, as well as the nature of the papal office to be the teacher of the entire church. The Roman church is the mother and teacher of all churches since the beginning. And so the pope must, with the help of the dicastery, uh, fulfill his first task to strengthen the faithful in faith, as our Lord said to St. Peter. And so, and not to confuse the faithful. And when there are theologians, as you mentioned, who obviously uh, contradict the perennial teaching of the Church with some trickery rhetorics, which is Gnostic method and heretic method, they are for sure not a help for the Pope but the contrary. And so mm -hmm. we must pray that the Pope may choose very true, faithfully theologians for his mm. advisors. Yeah, Your, Your Excellency, another moral theologian also appointed uh, to the dicastery of, of, of uh, the doctrine of faith, uh, Pier Davide Guenzi. He also has been appointed, and he says, in light of Amoris Laetitia, gay couples must be reconsidered, and, quote, we have learned that the natural law must be continually rethought, end quote. Bishop, your reaction, and how does Amoris Laetitia have such moral and doctrinal power that it authorizes the reinvestigation, indeed the rethinking, of natural law? I would say this is the tragedy of this document, Amoris Laetitiae, with this very ambiguous language, uh, which opens the door for um, erroneous interpretations, erroneous application for the moral life. It is simply a tool, becomes a tool for undermining the clear divine commandments. The mm. Pope, the Magisterium, 
is not above the divine commandments. He is not above the uh, word of God written and transmitted in tradition. As the Second Vatican Council says in the document De Verbum, that the magisterium, in first place the Pope, is the servant. He is mm. subject to the word of God. He has to serve it, mm. not to be the master or to change it, even mm. with, with uh, rhetorics or with some alleged pastoral methods. They must mm. correspond to the clear divine teaching. As you know, Your Excellency, Pope Francis made comments at an interreligious meeting last week that are still being felt. I'm still getting questions about this. He said, quote, every religion is a way to arrive at God. There are different languages to arrive at God, but God is for all. There is only one God, and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, they are different paths. Uh, Your Excellency, is every religion a path to God? And does that square with traditional Catholic teaching about Christ and the unique place his salvific power has in the world? Such affirmation of Pope Francis, which you quoted, is clearly against the divine revelation. It, it contradicts directly the first commandment of God which is ever valid. You shall not have other gods besides me. This is so clear. And such statement contradicts the entire gospel, where Jesus Christ said, no one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way to God. There, there are no other ways or paths. So in this statement, sadly, Regrettably, Pope Francis plainly contradicts the first commandment of God and the entire gospel. Hmm. That, that, that's, that's a difficult thing to process, I think, for a lot of Catholics, Bishop, that, uh, you know, the Pope is saying something that runs counter to the first commandment of God. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that as a bishop? How do you reconcile that as a faithful Catholic? Well, we had God permitted that the first pope, Simon Peter, he renounced, denied Christ, we you know, three times. Mm -hmm. And he was appointed the, the vicar of Christ and nevertheless, he denied Christ three times. Mm -hmm. So God permitted it that it could also happen in the future that a successor of Simon Peter would speak some words, some affirmations, which are contrary to the divine truth. It is rarely, but it happened with Peter, and it happened in very rare cases in the history. But Peter repented. And he again defended Christ and confessed him and gave his life for Christ as a martyr. And so mm. in this case today, we have to simply to pray for Pope Francis that he may receive this grace of the Lord as Peter received to repent and to again mm. clearly, courageously confess that there is no other name given to man in which they can be saved except Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, the only Redeemer of mankind. Uh, Bishop, I want to get your take on the upcoming Synod on Synodality. It's about to begin in October. Uh, before the Synod begins, participants will gather in retreat and they'll hold a, a penitential celebration led by Pope Francis. Now, according to the Secretary General of the Synod, in this communal confession of sorts, participants will confess sins in the name of the baptized. Those sins include, and I quote, sin against creation, against indigenous populations, against migrants, 
sin of using doctrine as stones to be hurled, sin against synodality, a lack of listening, communion, and participation of all. Bishop Schneider, does questioning the validity of, say, holy orders of women, a settled matter until recently, or attacks on marriage, does that constitute grave sin in your mind? Well, the, the so-called sin against synodality is an invented sin. We have no such sins in the divine revelation. It is a tool to promote a new agenda in the synod to establish new doctrines which are contrary to the divine revelation or undermine divine revelation. And such new established, invented doctrines in this so-called synodality, these are the true stones which they throw uh, to the faithful because they are distortions and these are hurting, harming the faithful and putting in danger the eternal salvation. And a true doctrine, it's not against charity. To transmit doctrine is one of the highest expression of charity towards the neighbor, to bring them the light of truth. And the light of truth only gives us true happiness. And such mm. confused new synodal doctrines and methods, they bring us ambiguity, uncertainty. And this, no one will give his life for something which is ambiguous, which is uncertain. Mm. We will only give our life for what is true, what is solid as a rock, which is Christ. He is the rock. He is the truth. And only for him, with God's grace, every Christian must be ready to give his life. Your Excellency, I, I thought communal confession and absolution were only to be given in extreme emergencies, like in times of war. Your thoughts on uh, creating this uh, public uh, penitential service to, to forgive these alleged sins at the start of a synod? Well, I don't know if this will be a real a sacramental ab abs a general absolution in Rome. I don't know. if mm. It should not be because a so-called general sacramental absolution, according to the Church norms, are only possible in extreme situations of emergency, of danger of life. And there is no danger of life and emergency in Rome, there are plenty priests so that people can do an individual confession mm -hmm. of their sins according to the doctrine and praxis of the Church. Mm. Uh, B Bishop Schneider, uh, as we've been reporting over many, many weeks, the most controversial issues from last year's synod, uh, women's ordination, LGBT issues, those have now all been removed from discussion and shifted to study groups. My question is, does it concern you that those issues will not be discussed in public, but only within these groups that are being hand-selected until June of next year? Well, I think this concerns me because the truth must be spoken, discussed openly and in a transparency. Nothing is hidden which will not be revealed. And such methods can be also dangerous. Then then will appear a document suddenly, as we had last year with the so-called fiducia supplicants document, suddenly appeared a document which introduced such an ab abomination of giving blessings to homosexual evidently homosexual unions, which contradicts natural law, contradicts divine law. And I hope that such commissions will not produce such a sudden document for female ordinations or other issues which will plainly contradict divine revelation or undermine it. So, mm. therefore, I think we must 
pray very fervently all the, the true sons and daughters of the Church, that God may intervene in His Holy Church, in the Holy See, and again give us shepherds in Rome, all over the world, where true ap apostolic man, true Catholic, to mm. serve the Lord and not the time. Mm. Your Excellency, tell me how your book, Flee from Heresy, and the historical analysis it provides into these heresies, how do they help us today dealing with all that we're seeing and to put into context what we're seeing? What's the lesson for the faithful here? Yes, we are today witnessing the height of the so-called modernism, which is, according to the definition of Pope Pius X, a synthesis of all heresies which existed. And so it is, because it is completely relativistic. And therefore, it is necessary and helpful for the faithful to know that uh, there were already so many heresies and to identify them. And so when they are today observing such confusion, they may say, oh, these were already in some way present in the past time. And we have to be aware and know well our faith. So when you are concerned with the bodily health, you must know mm. the, the dangers for your health, the viruses, and so on. And so the heresies and errors are kind of spiritual poisons and viruses which we must know to protect ourselves, to protect our children, the youth, and all the people of goodwill who sincerely seek the truth. This is the spiritual health. And therefore, uh, to warn people of heresy, to say them flee from heresy, is one of the greatest acts of true charity. Mm. Yeah, Bishop, reading your book, it, it, it reminds me there's nothing new under the sun, including heresies. They continue to repeat themselves through time. They just take on different guises, slightly different uh, masks. But in, on the whole, it's the same through line. It's the same virus, as you said. Flee from Heresy, a Catholic guide to ancient and modern errors by Bishop Athanasius Schneider is available now at bookstores everywhere and online and, of course, through the EWTN catalog. Bishop Schneider, thank you for being here. You're welcome.